Welcome to HelpYourMath.com. In this video, we're going to look at the nth roots of nth powers of whatever specified variable. And then we're going to look at some shortcuts when it's not just the nth power, but uh, multiples of the nth power. So to start, we're going to assume x is a real number and n is a positive integer greater than 1. Then, so we want to think about what each of these would be. So the square root of x squared. Now you might be thinking, well, obviously the square and the square root cancel each other out and the value is x. But that's not true because if x is negative 2, then it would be negative 2 quantity squared. And the square root of that, which would be the square root of positive 4, which is 2, 2 does not equal x. So therefore, we can't say that it always equals x. What we do say is that it equals the absolute value of x because you square it, which is going to turn it positive, and then when you take the square root, that's finding the principal root, which is the positive or non-negative root. Okay, so now the cubed root of x cubed. You might be thinking, I got this, it's the square root of, or the absolute value of x. And that's not true, because if x is negative 2, I'm just going to stick with this example, why, why not? And we have the cubed root of negative 2 cubed. Well, the cubed root of negative 8 would actually be negative 2. So in this case, assuming that x is a real number, then the cubed root of x cubed would in fact be x. All right, now what about the fourth root of x to the fourth? Which one is it? Well, what's going to happen when we raise something to the fourth power? No matter what we raise to the fourth power, it's going to end up being non-negative. The minimum is zero, and then it would be anything bigger than zero also, which means when we take the fourth root of x to the fourth, the result will be the absolute value of x. And then the fifth root of x to the fifth, well, that would be x itself because we can have negative fifth roots. So to summarize, if we have, if we want to take the nth root of x to the n, then if n is even, it would be the absolute value of x. And if n is odd, it would be x itself. Okay, so we're going to do a bunch of examples here. First, we're going to start off with integers and, or integers and rational numbers, and then we're going to move on to variables. Uh, so we want to evaluate without using a calculator. And if you don't know your perfect squares, cubes, powers of 4, powers of 5, it doesn't hurt to make a list of these. Um, so let's, or we can just think about this. Since these all have basically the same radicand, we're, we're pretty okay here. So the cubed root of 8... 8 would be 2 cubed, and in this case, the result would be, well, 2, because the cube and the cube root would cancel each other out. So the cube root of 8 is 2. The cube root of negative 8, well, that would be the cube root of negative 2 cubed, which would be negative 2. The negative cubed root of negative 8, order of operations says we're going to start here because this is considered a grouping symbol, whereas the negative is considered multiplication. Well, the cubed root of negative 8 we just did is negative 2, but it's the negative of that or the opposite of that, which would be 2. Okay, some more examples. We have the fourth root of 16. So that's asking ourselves what number when we multiply it uh, as a, we use it as a factor four times gives us 16. So it has to be pretty small because multiplying something four times gets big quickly. And that would be 2 to the 4th. So uh, 16 is 2 to the 4th. And then since 2 is positive, we're all good. The result would be 2. Even if 2 was negative, the, the result would still be 2. The fifth root of negative 32. So this time we're looking at the fifth root. So we're trying to figure out, is 32 or negative 32 a perfect power of 5? And it is. In fact, it's 2 again. Well, in this case, it'd be negative 2 since it's negative 32. Sorry, let's try that again. I'm saying 2 and writing 2. All right, so now the fifth root and the, the fifth power ca cancel each other out, and the result is negative 2. Here we have the third root of negative 27 over 125. So what we can do is we can take that negative and assign it to either the numerator or the denominator, or it doesn't matter, you don't have to do that. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming to see a fraction in a radicand. So we can actually split it up and say it's the cubed root up with the negative up with 27 of negative 27 over the cubed root of 125. Then we just do each one separately, and it's a lot less scary. You can just cover up the bottom portion and say, okay, the cubed root of negative 27, so what number times itself times itself equals negative 27? That would be negative 3. So that would be the cubed root of negative 3 cubed. And then what times itself times itself gives us 125? That would be 5 cubed. 
So now the cubed uh, root and the cubes will cancel and we're left with negative three over five or if you want to put that negative back out in front we can say negative three-fifths. Three more examples of just rational numbers. The fourth root of negative 81 over 256 and you might be saying oh no I don't know my fourth roots that well. Well there's good news because uh, the fourth root of something negative is not a real number. So we can just say not a real number. If you want to get fancy, uh, you could go into imaginary numbers. That would be fine too. If you want, did want to delve into the imaginary numbers, you would, we would factor out, well, I wouldn't even worry about that with the fourth root. I would not, I would just say not a real number and call it a day. In the middle, we have the square root of negative 64. So remember when we don't see an index, it's assumed to be an index of two. And the square root of negative 64 is also not a real number. Now, if you did want to delve into imaginary numbers, since it's a square root, it's a little uh, simpler to do. It would be 8i in the complex number system. But if, it's, if it specifies what real number is it, we can just say, well, it's not a real number and be done. The cubed root of negative 64 does exist. It is a real number because we can multiply one number to itself to itself to get negative 64. And that would be if we took negative 4 and cubed it. So this would end up being negative 4. Okay, in these four examples, we're going to look at some variables and some uh, integers, it looks like. Maybe there's going to be a few rational uh, numbers. I'm not sure. Let's see what we can come up with here. Now, one thing to be careful of. So if we look at this slide, it says simplify each radical expression. It doesn't have us make any assumptions. If I go to the next slide, it says assume all variables are positive. Assume all variables are positive. Since it does not say that, we may not make that assumption. So we have to be really careful with these because of the fact that we need to know whether we get to assume that variables are positive or not. And so for these four examples, we don't get to make that assumption, which means the square root of b squared, we don't know whether b is positive or negative or zero. So we need to say that the square root of b squared is the absolute value of b. In the second one, the fourth root of a to the fourth, same thing. We don't know whether a is positive or negative. And it would matter here because raising something to the fourth would turn a negative positive. So here again, we would see the absolute value of a. In the next example, we have the square root of x to the fourth. Now for this one, um, if you are a little bit stuck here, we can rewrite this as a perfect square. So x to the fourth is x squared squared. So it is a perfect square. It's x squared squared. And now the question is, do we need to include the absolute value or not? Well, if we take the square root of x squared squared, we would end up with x squared. Do we need to put that inside an absolute value? No, because when you square something, it's going to turn it positive. So even if we started out with negative 2, the end result would still be positive 4 because we're squaring it. So we don't need to include the absolute value there. All right, in our last example, we have the square root of 25 m to the 24th n to the 6th. If we rewrite each piece as a perfect square, we would have 5 squared. m to the 24th would be m to the 12th squared, right? Because for power to a power, we would multiply the exponents. So if we're looking for a perfect square, that means we would need 12. And then n to the 6th would be n cubed squared. Again, power to a power, 3 times 2 would get us back to 6. Now we can take the square root of each piece. The square root of 5 squared is 5. The square root of m to the 12th squared, well, the square root and the square would cancel would be m to the 12th. And do we need to worry about putting an absolute value sign there? Well, no, because if we were to raise something to the 12th power, it's going to turn it positive anyway, unless it's zero, in which case it would be zero. So we don't need to worry about absolute value for m. What about for n? The square root of n cubed squared would be n cubed. n cubed, if it is negative, it would it should continue to be negative. So we actually need to put it in absolute values because it will become uh, the positive version of itself. All right, in our next examples, as we said here, we do get to assume all variables are positive, meaning we don't have to worry about these absolute values anymore. So yay, we got those over with. All right, and what we're going to try to do here is we're going to try to look for a shortcut to see if there's a simpler way to do this, whereas I keep writing everything as perfect squares. Is there something we could do instead that would make this go a lot faster? All right, so we have the square root of 16x to the 16th. 16 is a perfect square, it is 4 squared. And x to the 16th is a perfect square, it's x to the 8th squared. 
the square root of 4 squared is 4. The square root of x to the 8th squared would be x to the 8th. And I don't know why this is doing this. Let me see if I can move it and see if that helps. 4, there we go, x to the 8th. And even though we, we don't have to worry about it, this would not have absolute value bars anyway because it's x to the 8th. All right, the next example, we have negative 5a times the square root of 49a to the 8th b to the 4th c squared. So under the radical and the radicand, we're going to rewrite each one as a perfect square, each factor. 49 is 7 squared. A, uh, a to the 8th would be a to the 4th squared. And again, I'm just kind of like undoing power to a power here. b to the 4th would be b squared squared and c squared is just c squared, so you can just leave it like that. Okay, let's take our square roots. We have 5a, negative 5a, which we're not taking the square root of because it was not in the radical. I don't know why the middle of the board is weird. All right, negative 5a. The square root of 7 squared would be 7. The square root of a to the fourth squared would be a to the fourth. The square root of b squared squared would be b squared, and the square root of c squared would be c. So now we want to combine the factors that we can combine, negative 5 times 7 is negative 35. A times a to the fourth is a to the fifth, and then b squared c. So this would be our final simplified answer down here. Next, we do see the fraction. Uh, it looks like we can actually simplify this because 4 goes into 64. So we can rewrite this as the abs uh, square root of 64 divided by 4 is 16. And then x to the ninth divided by x to the third is x to the sixth. So rewriting each of those as a perfect square would be 4 squared times x cubed squared. So that would give us 4x cubed is our final answer. And if we didn't get to make this assumption, yes, that x cubed would need to go in the absolute value bars. Okay, in our next example, we have the negative cubed root of 8h over 1000h to the 7th. So again, we can actually simplify this, except we're going to still end up with a fraction, but that's okay. Uh, we would have the cubed root, 8 goes into 1,000, it goes in 125 times, and h goes in h to the 7th, h to the 6th times, so we actually end up with a, a numerator of 1. So when we go to rewrite this, we have this negative. Uh, if you want to, you can split up the cubed roots to make it less scary, so we have the cubed root of 1, and the cubed root of 1 is, or, yeah, 1 cubed. And then we have the cubed root, 125 has a cubed root of 5, and h to the 6th would be h to the 3rd squared. So we have negative 1 over 5h cubed. And remember what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be looking for a pattern. So let's see if we find a pattern here with the variables. We had x to the 16th, and it became x to the 8th. So what's the special relationship between 16 and 8? Well, 8 is half of 16. Interesting. What about here? We have a to the 8th, and it became a to the 5th, but originally it was a to the 4th because there was that extra factor of a. Well, 4 is half of 8, and here we have 2 is half of 4, and here we have 1 is half of 2. So it looks like there is a pattern that emerges from this, and that's good to know because I like shortcuts. Let's see if those shortcuts continue with these last four examples. The cubed root of 64x cubed y to the 6th. So again, I'm going to write each factor as a perfect cube. Let's see if the, I can write right there. Ooh, it looks like I can. That would be 4 cubed x cubed would just be x to the first cubed, and then y to the sixth would be y squared cubed. Now this cube would cancel with those cubes, leaving us with 4xy squared. Beautiful. Next we have the fourth root of 625p to the 24th, q to the 12th. So we're looking for perfect powers of 4. 625 is a perfect power of 4 with a fourth root of 5. 5 to the fourth p to the 24th is a perfect power of 4 because we could write it as p to the 6th to the 4th, and q to the 12th is a perfect power of 4, it would be q cubed to the 4th. Now this uh, index of 4 cancels with the powers of 4, we're left with 5 p to the 6th q cubed. The next example we're looking for the fifth root, so we're going to take each factor and write it as a, a perfect fifth root, so that would be 2 to the 5th, a squared to the fifth, oops, let me not forget my index, and b to the seventh to the fifth. Now that index of five cancels with all those powers of five, leaving us with two a squared b to the seventh. 
And our last example, it's already factored for us. Look at this. The cube root cancels with the cube, leaving us with a plus b. So, oh, let's see. Did that shortcut work again? Well, here we had the cubed root, or the perfect cube, and we took the cubed root. So it's like if we divide it here, we would end up with 1. Yep. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Here, 24 divided by 4 is 6. 12 divided by is great. So what do we notice about the index and the exponent when we simplify? I'm going to do this to see if I can get this to work. There we go. If the exponent is a multiple of the index, then we can simplify that factor by dividing the exponent by the index. So, for example, if we have the nth root of x to the k times n, just meaning to, k times n just means that one of the two uh, factors of the exponent is n, this would simplify to x to the k. And we do want to be careful here because if it doesn't say we need to assume everything's positive, we could run into some trouble with absolute values. So we just want to be really careful about that. But this is a nice shortcut and it will work um, as long as the uh, variable has an exponent that is a multiple of the index.